What is up YouTube? Dots Gaming here and today I'm bringing you guys the next episode of my Battleground Basic series. I know the series went away for a while, a long while, the Dungeon Guide series and this did kind of fall aside as I had some other guides and videos and builds that I wanted to put up on YouTube, but because I've worked through that video queue, we are now back with the Battleground Basic series, and this has been a video that people have requested from me, specifically related to Battlegrounds, but just in general, for a while, and that is a how to build your character and what class to play. Uh, I can tell you guys this video is not going to contain any gameplay. This is going to be a completely informational video, so do keep that in mind. So I'm going to be showing you guys a lot of different stuff on my website as well as some stuff on the UESP website. So this is going to be purely informational, so hopefully you guys do enjoy it. Uh, so let's get right into it. The first thing I do want to say, though, is that creating a build... Theory crafting, understanding game mechanics, how classes work within the context of other skills, gear sets, champion points, all the stuff that goes into a build takes a lot of time and a lot of practice. I did not become proficient at building overnight. There was a lot of failed attempts, a lot of failed builds. There still is sometimes nowadays. Uh, every now and then I'll come up with something that I think is a good idea. I test it and it doesn't work, but that's just the nature of the building process. And that's the fun of it is getting to experiment, try things, see how they work. Uh, if they sound good on, on paper, but don't work in practice, or maybe they don't sound as good in paper, but surprise you when you do actually put the builds on and use them. It's a never ending learning process that is a ton of fun and it can get expensive. <laughs> it can get expensive. And plus, I'm sure if you guys ever seen my bank on stream and me try to find stuff, I have so many coffers and, and a full bank of stuff. Uh, so the theory crafting process and the building process is definitely, it's a fun one and it, there is a learning curve to it. Uh, so if you guys want builds to start off with, and kind of, you know, give you a base to maybe understand some thought processes and where people are going from. I do have plenty of PvP builds on my website. Every class, every role, basically, Stam DK, Mag DK, Stam Nightblade, Mag Nightblade, Stam Temp, uh, Stam Sork, Mag Sork, Stamplar, Magplar, Templar Healer, Stam Warden, Mag Warden, and Warden Healer. So we do have builds that you can start off with if you want to look at some stuff that myself and other members of my community have made. You can start off with that and eventually, you know, and continue to tune those to how you like. But the rest of this guide is going to cover if you want to maybe try to take a dive into your first build creation on your own. Uh, so I'm going to cover a lot of different factors. Now, this is not gospel. This is just my opinion. Okay, and the process that I go through and the things that I think about, this is not a one-size-fits-all. Everyone builds their characters differently. Everyone has a different method to their madness, so to speak. Uh, so this is just what I personally do and kind of the things that I think about. So the class choice, specifically as well for Battlegrounds, pretty much is up to you. Uh, the balance really does continually shift and change, so I wouldn't pick necessarily pick a class based on quote-unquote what's best. I've never been a believer in that. I've always been a believer in play what you think is fun and you can make it work, especially in a game like The Elder Scrolls Online. Uh, certain classes obviously are a little bit easier within a predefined PvP meta or what the community believes is the PvP meta at the time. But you've seen meta shift within the patch with no changes once people discover a certain thing that works really, really well. Uh, so, you know, I would just honestly play whatever class you like, what you think is the most fun and what you think is cool. And obviously has the most pl the play style that you enjoy the most. And, and I think you'll have the best time on that. So that's what I personally recommend class-wise. Uh, but I'm going to kind of talk more about the, the building today. Just because, like I said, I do truly believe that class, whether you want or not you want to play Stamina or Magicka, is a bit, more, um, a bit more personal. But speaking of Stamina versus Magicka... Stamina tends to be, in my opinion, a bit better for PvP at the moment, simply because mobility is king right now. Uh, Magicka classes have a lot of trouble keeping up with stamina classes, because stamina classes just have way better movement. And I always say it on my stream, mobility is your greatest form of mitigation, which is why stamina and mag sorks, because they have streak, uh, tend to do a bit better, in my opinion, than the rest of the Magicka classes. But thankfully, in Battlegrounds... <clears throat> and I am also talking from a solo PvP perspective and group PvP. Um, you can pretty much run anything and, and your group will complement each other. I'm talking mainly about solo or like twos or threes. Uh, but inside of Battlegrounds specifically, 
you don't feel as much of the um, you don't feel as much of the movement issues that Magicka tends to suffer because the areas are smaller. There's less you know area to move around, and there's less ground to cover. So a lot of the mobility woes that Magicka faces in Cyrodiil don't impact it as much inside of battlegrounds. Uh, it's just because, you know, Magicka pretty much relies on cleanses, mist form, uh, DK has wings. Uh, so it relies on, like, a lot of stuff that has very short durations or, you know, having vampirism obviously has a huge negative attached to it of being able to get super hit super hard by Dawnbreaker and Flame. So in general, Magicka mobility could use a little bit of help. Now, building for BGs, we're gonna t I'm going to talk about Stam DPS, Mag DPS, and Healers. I'm not going to be covering tanks because... The way you can be able to build a CC tank for PvP is it's so personal. It's this too varied. Uh, so I'm going to be covering the most common stuff, which is Stam DPS, Mag DPS, and Healers. Now, for attribute-wise, should go without saying, for Stam DPS, you're going all into Stam. For Mag DPS and Healer, you're going all into Magicka. It's just the basic way to build. If you have any questions on why this is the way it is, check out my Complete Beginner Guide, specifically the Attribute section. Now, you can create hybrid builds as well, uh, but hybrids are more niche and I'm also not a fan of hybrids, so I'm not going to be covering them. There are plenty of other YouTubers and content creators that love hybrid builds and do cover them, but for me, it's never been a playstyle I liked, so I won't be covering them today. Now, in terms of armor, for your Magicka, DPS, or Healer, your choices are obviously light and heavy, depending on what you like. And for Stamina, your choices are medium and heavy. Heavy will obviously be the tankier between the two, even if you have... <clears throat> And I've always seen people make the argument of, like, the resistance argument, like, well, you know, you can get as many resistances in medium as you can in heavy, so it's going to be just as tanky, but more damage. But the one thing that I've especially experienced um, as of late is that a lot of people do, I think, underestimate the passives from the heavy armor line and how much healing and extra defense you get from them. So I still believe in the thought process that if you want to be tankier, you're just better off playing in heavy armor. Obviously, medium armor will give you higher damage, and you should still try to get, or same thing with light armor, and you should still try to get a higher, as many as many resistances as you physically can, but if you do want to be super tanky, I still think that heavy is the way to go, and I do have an armor guide on my website that you could check out if you do want to uh, look a bit deeper into this topic, or if you're just a beginner and don't have any idea what I'm talking about, uh, this, this will be a, a good place for you to look, but... I, I, that's kind of like the way I've been enjoying it. I think that kind of is more for stamina, though, than for Magicka, though, based on my experience. I feel that Magicka has some sets that can you can get super tanky in light armor and still take advantage of the light armor passives. Uh, granted, you won't have the same Magicka sustained due to Constitution, and again, you won't have that same healing uh, due to, I believe it's Revitalize is the name of that passive that gives you the 8% extra healing. Um, but at least from my experiences from Stam, Medi uh, heavy armor tends to be a, a tankier. So if you want to be tankier in, in for, for stamina, I would recommend heavy. If you want to be, you know, almost as tanky, not quite though, but have more damage, then medium is going to be the way to go. For magical characters, it's kind of the same thing. Uh, light armor tends to be your higher damage, and medium armor is obviously, or excuse me, heavy armor is going to be tankier. But... The reason that, especially for light armor, this is for me, I actually really enjoy playing tanky light armor, so you get to, you basically want to try to stack up your resistances as close to cap as possible while wearing light armor, is because the light armor passives, in my opinion, are better than the medium armor passives. Uh, the light armor passives give a, a so much benefit, specifically concentration, which gives you spell penetration. And in PvP, penetration is one of the most important stats, especially since the shield changes. So basically, when the changes to shields happened in Merkmire, shields have now can now be affected by penetration. Now, penetration used to be able to be a wasted stat in certain instances. When fighting a shield, it would be wasted, so you wouldn't want to overbuild pen because fighting certain targets, it would be useless. But now, penetration is never a useless stat, which makes the passives from light armor that much more tantalizing. Plus. Let's be honest, we all know if we've played PvP for a while, a lot of the heavy armor sets tend to favor stamina and a stamina-based playstyle. So stamina can take more advantage of a lot of the crazy heavy armor sets like Seventh Legion, Fury, Veil Tyrants, Ravager, etc. While Magicka doesn't really get that benefit. So 
at least for me, I prefer if I'm going to be playing Magicka to play tanky light armor. Healer, I'm really going to say it's a fat. It depends. I've spec'd out some healer guides for heavy. I've spec'd out some healer guides for light. Um, I think that for healer, I'm always a little bit more inclined to heavy because you are tankier and you're not dealing damage to somebody else. So, and you're just healing your friends. So I think that the extra tankiness from the heavy armor passives is going to be super beneficial to a healer. But for a Magicka person, I would pers I personally prefer light nowadays. I think it, it is more it is more enjoyable. For stamina, I prefer heavy. For Magic DPS, I prefer light. And for healer, I prefer heavy. But those are just my preferences. Uh, if you want to, you know... So I hope you guys can see the way I'm going to be kind of doing this is going through my thought processes, kind of just like a flow of consciousness, basically, because there's a lot of stuff to consider. There's a lot of stuff to consider. So I just hope that you guys sit down, listen to this whole guide, and and just take in all the information and consider all this stuff when deciding what you should do. And I will be showing some build examples near the end of the video. Uh, so in terms of your armor breakdowns, you basically have three options, 5-1-1, 5-2, or 6-1. So basically, it's going to be five of your primary armor type, one and then one piece of the other two uh so that's one way you could go or you could also go five two for magic for magica and stam you're either going to go the five medium or five light and then two heavy most common i've seen there or you could even go six one where you do six light six medium or six heavy with one of either light or medium it's really up to you <coughs> me personally i prefer five one one or five two i have never really run a six one so i'll usually run five pieces of light and either two heavy or five pieces of light five pieces of medium or five pieces of heavy and run two of another set based off of what bonuses I want, or I'll just run a trade up five, one, one for max stats. It is really up to you, but those are the three combinations I would obviously recommend. Now, in terms of weapons, again, I have a weapons guide on my website. You are more than welcome to check this out if you need the basics about weapons. So in terms of your weapon choices, you're pretty much looking at stabs and sword and board for Magicka. Stabs include Destro stabs and Resto stabs, so you're looking at them, or sword and shield for Magicka. And for stamina, you're looking at sword and shield, 2H, dual wield, and bow as your options. Stamina has a lot of weapon choices, more so than Magicka. Um, and I know some people are going to ask two things. One, why don't you recommend dual wield or 2H for Magicka? Two, why do you recommend sword and shield for Magicka? When in doubt, look at the passives. The passives are a huge, huge thing to consider when creating a build. Most questions about why someone does something when they make a build guide can be answered by looking at the passives. And I always want new players especially to keep this in mind. So Sword and Shield is super good for Magicka, especially slow-moving units like Templars and Dragon Knights because the passives just literally complement the play style so well and they don't require a single skill slotted to actually take advantage of them. So using a Sword and Shield will allow you to very reliably block, especially if you use like two to four pieces of Sturdy, depending on what you like. And you also get the, a crazy amount of resistances from actually using a Sword and Shield. So it's a really, really good defensive back bar for a lot of classes. Uh, the Warden could also... Um, I've seen Mag Warden take advantage of Sword and Board. I've seen the occasional Mag Sork build use Sword and Shield. So it's just... It's a really, really good secondary bar. Uh, Resto Staff is also, of course, a good healing bar. I don't recommend Resto Staff on... This is just me personally. I don't enjoy Resto Staff on, like, Mag DK because Mag DK has so much healing baked into the class that I think you're better off getting the block properties and the um, resistances from a sword and shield and just using the healing in your own kit than trying to crutch on like just simply something like what would you get even from it like either mutagen or the gimped healing ward so for me I I would again look at your class look how many heals you're able to get from your kit and decide, do I really need this Resto Staff, or can I use a Sword and Shield for my defensive bar, take advantage of that uh, that extra armor and the block, and be able to use the heals just from my class. So, so do consider that when building. Um, I've, I'm not a huge fan of the Resto Staff anymore. Certain classes, I, I think, really do use it well. Magic of Nightblade, um, Magic of Sorcerer, you know, do use it well. But certain slower moving classes might want to take a look at potentially using Sword and Shield. So that is something to consider. Now, in terms of your offensive bar, 
I recommend Inferno Staves or Lightning Staves if you deal, if your uh, main attacks are AoE attacks, something like a Magical Warden, which uses Shulks as your main burst, and Permafrost, which are both AoEs, will take better advantage of a Lightning Staff. But most most people will take advantage of an Inferno Staff. And now some people are going to say, Dots, why an Inferno Staff? You you know, Sword and Board, or excuse me, sword and, uh, Double Sword and Two-Handed Sword could also possibly work. In my opinion... The reason to use the melee weapons as a primary damage bar on a Magicka class is completely gone. I don't think it exists anymore. So two-handed was always a very niche play style. It wasn't very, like, it wasn't very common. You you would only see it very occasionally or in, like, Pelinal setups where you would try to actually take advantage of the major brutality from forward momentum. But... Overall, 2H was always super niche, so you don't really, I, I can't in all good faith recommend it as like a common weapon. But dual wield, I think, is going to be the most common one where people are like, why can't I use dual wield anymore? They have taken away basically every reason to use dual wield on a Magicka class, and it does obviously make me a little sad because I used to love dual wield Magicka, but it, it's it's so inferior to an Inferno staff nowadays, in my opinion. Uh, if you think about it, they nerfed the enchant damages in half. So builds that would try to take advantage of just the enchants on dual wields can't really do it anymore because the enchants are not nearly as good anymore. And you used to be able to use dual wield to get a second five piece bonus on your front bar. But ever since Somerset where staves count as two pieces, that reason has also gone away. So the only reason is that you would ever do it is to make your stat sheet have a little bit more spell damage than if you use an Inferno Staff. But in practice, an Inferno Staff will net you more damage because your Light Attack Waves aren't complete crap. So, and plus you also do get the Inferno Staff passives as well. And you also get access to the Elemental Drain, which for a lot of classes is an amazing form of breach and sustain. So it, it's just, Dual Wield is not worth it anymore, in my opinion. You're just, offensive bar is better off being an Inferno Staff. I just think it is personally the way to go. Now on to stamina. Stamina, I'm going to say, has a lot more personal choice when it comes to its weapons. Uh, you have sword and board, 2H, dual wield, and bow. And I've seen uh, basically any combination of these things work. Most of the time, you will have a 2H in your build. It's kind of the secondary bar that it differs, whether or not you're going to use a sword and shield, dual wield, or a bow. That very much depends. And the reason you want to primarily use a 2H is because of the skill forward momentum slash rally, which gives you um, major brutality, which is a 20% bonus to your weapon damage, as well as, um, as well as gives you a heal if you use rally, like a really good heal if you use rally, or if you use forward momentum, you gain snare removal slash uh, immunity. Really, really good skill. So you're normally going to be pairing a 2H with something else. But well, that something else, totally personal preference. Totally personal preference. You can use Sword and Board, Dual Wield, Bow, all very viably. Now, race choice is very personal as well now. Um, I do also have a racial passives guide on my website that you can check out and see what I recommend. Um, but in general, I'll just give you, uh, like, your your selections are very personal based on your build, based how your stat sheet lays out and what you're looking to do. For stamina, you're looking at Orc, Dunmer, Khajiit, Nord, Imperial, Redguard, or Bosmer. And for Magicka, you're looking at Argonia, Dunmer, Altmer, Breton, or Khajiit. And then for healers, you're looking at Argonians or Bretons. Now, I do, in my guide here, recommend Khajiit for PvE, but for PvP... I think Argonian and Bretons are way better because Jeet are an option, but I think Argonians and Bretons are way better just because they give way more sustain and they're both tankier. Now your Mundus, where's my Mundus? Mundus is going to, I also have a guide here. <laughs> Mundus is going to depend on your build, but the most common and most popular options I've seen are the Atronach stone for healer. Uh, for Magicka, you have the Atronach, the Apprentice, and the Mage. And for Stamina, you have the Serpent and the Warrior. Those are your most common ones that I've seen used. Um, in case you don't know, I'll go over them. Atronach gives Magicka Recovery. Apprentice gives Spell Damage. Mage gives Magicka. Serpent gives Stamina Recovery. And Warrior gives Weapon Damage. So those are the most common ones I've seen used. You obviously can use other Mundus Stones. There are builds that do use other ones. But if you're looking for your most popular options kind of to start with for your theory crafting process, I would recommend these based off the rules I just mentioned now 
overall, your build is going to depend on a lot of personal preference. There's a lot of customizability with all of this stuff that I've gone over, but you, there's a lot of things you need to consider. Resource pools, resistances, damage, crit resist, penetration, things like that. Like there's a lot of variables and a lot of things that you do need to check out. How you know balance your weapon damage and your stamina, where your your spell damage and your magic. There's a lot of bit of balancing that needs to go on between all of these things. So I'm going to kind of go over that. And that and in my opinion that kind of comes with practice and kind of comes with testing and looking at builds to see what people do and what people have found to work. Uh but I'll kind of go over that a little bit more in my when I go over my builds and kind of show you what I what I like to do. Uh, now, the biggest thing I recommend to people, because this drives me up a wall when people ask me about it, do not forget to place points into your passives. Do not forget to use potions. Do not forget to use buff food. And do not forget to gold out your weapons. I want to cover this really quick right here before I move into CP. I have it written down. One of the biggest issues I run into when I'm talking to people is people always go, Dots, I copied your build exactly and my stats are not the same. And I can't imagine when people try to make their own builds, these same people, what what troubles they run into and probably why they end up turning to build guides all the time because they can't figure it out. And, and you guys need to understand that ESO is a game of passives and all of these passives add up. So if you do not have buff food, your stats are gonna be horrible. If you're not using potions, you're missing out on like up to three potential major buffs on your character. You need to make sure you have points in all of your passives, your class passives, the weapons you're using, the armors you're using, any guild skill lines, always have Undaunted. You're missing out on free stats if you're not using Undaunted Metal. And you need medicinal use from Alchemy as well to make sure that your potions have 100% uptime on those major buffs. Uh, you also need to get your assault skill line and your support skill line and your racial passives. All of those things add up and add together in creating the power and a build. Also, I, I've been seeing this question a lot recently on my stream, <clears throat> and I'm not sure why it's been coming up a lot, is that people are, uh, are thinking that you need to gold out your entire gear setup in order to be competitive, but that's just simply not the case. You need to gold out your weapons and your weapons only really in my opinion because that's where most of the damage comes from there is a huge damage increase between and healing increase between a purple weapon and a gold weapon it's an absolutely massive difference but for your gear sets like your just your armor and your jewelry the difference is pretty minimal i mean obviously you, you if you have the money and if you love your setup you can go ahead and gold it out but the difference between somebody wearing full gold gear and gold weapons versus somebody in full purple gear and gold weapons is incredibly small it's really not that big. Besides golding out weapons, the only other thing I'd really recommend golding out for your normal player is a monster set that deals damage. Since golding out that monster set will directly increase the amount of damage that that monster set does. But besides that, just gold out the weapons. But make sure your weapons are gold. Can't say how many people are like, Dots, I don't have the same spell damage as you or same weapon damage as you. Why is that? And I go, your weapon is gold. And they go, no. And I'm like, well, there you go. You know, that you just got to make sure that all of those things are done. So with that little tangent out of the way, we're going to also move on to champion points. So we have two guides that I want you guys to check out in regard to champion points. I have a guide called Which CP Are Best and Why? And ESO CP Jump Points Explain. Both of these guides can be found on my website. You need to make sure that you're putting your points in stars that are actually good and relevant to your build. And adhering to jump points so that you're getting the most out of your CP placed. Now... Your blue CP is going to obviously be, uh, I'd say green CP is pretty much the most um, the most customizable because everyone sustains a little bit differently. But your red CP and your blue CP are, in my opinion, super important to make sure that they're as optimized as possible so that you're getting the most damage and the most mitigation out of your build possible. And if you go to my guide here, it'll explain everything in depth. But one thing I do want to touch on it really quick for here is Master at Arms versus Thaumaturge. Um, I do think those are going to be the two big things that people need to consider. Uh, so Master at Arms increases your damage done with direct damage attacks by X percent, while Thaumaturge increases your damage done with, da with damage over time effects by X percent. Now, a direct damage attack 
I'll use uh, Burning Embers as an example here because it's the perfect example. Burning Embers deals damage on hit and then applies and then deals damage over time. Now that damage on hit is instantaneous damage when the ability is clicked. That is direct damage. Thaumaturge will increase. So Thaumaturge will increase the dot. So the damage over time part. So basically you hit somebody with Burning Embers. It hits them instantly. Direct damage. Master at Arms. The damage that occurs to them over a time period afterwards is a damage over time. It's a dot. So it's affected by Thaumaturge. Channels are also affected by Thaumaturge. So Biting Jabs, Soul Assault, Flurry, anything that deals its damage over a time period, which is literally the definition of a channel, is affected by Thaumaturge. So hopefully that kind of clears that up and it shows you where you should be placing your points. Uh, kind of showing you like, okay, I run a crap ton of things that deal damage over a time period in my build. So I'm going to put more points in a Thaumaturge. Or, hey, I only run a couple for some damage support. Most of my damage is coming from direct sources like Flame Lash deals direct damage. You know, I'm going to buff up Master at Arms as humanly po as much as humanly possible. So again, consider that stuff when, when placing your points in your build. So I just wanted to cover those two specifically just because I do get a lot of questions on those. And like I said, do make sure you adhere to jump points so that you get the most value out of your CP. This explains what jump points are. It's very simple. Uh, so you can go check that out if you'd like. Now, before I move into uh, skills and play style and things that you want to consider, I do want to mention buff efficiency. Buff efficiency is very, very key for any build. Any build having an efficient buff spread is super important. I was actually like, when I was reading, like, kind of going based off my outline here, because I know it's a little bit of a stream of consciousness, but um, I do have a rough outline. And I was like wondering when I was actually going to get to buff efficiency. So we are here now. Now, buff efficiency is a key component in any build. You want to make sure that you are not overlapping buffs. It's, it's super important. So for example, in any build, right, you want one source of major ward and resolve, at least, you know, or just one source of major brutality and major sorcery, or major sorcery, depending on if you're Magicka, sorcery, stamina, brutality. Uh, you want major expedition, specifically for stam. Uh, if you can get it as Magicka, that's great, but no, you can't always get it. So for stam, I would recommend a source of major expedition is if you're not running a gap closer. Um, even if you are, I would try recommend trying to get it because uh, stamina has a much easier time getting it. And then any other major buffs that you can get, but make sure it's just one source. Make sure it's just one source, okay? So, for example, you're not going to run Flying Blade on one bar and Rally on another bar. You have two sources of Major Brutality that is, that's not buff efficient, right? You can only have one source of a Major or Minor buff active on you at once. So, why have two sources of Major Brutality when you can use that skill slot to either get a different skill or get a different buff, you know? You want as many buffs and debuffs that you can provide on your on your build as you physically can. So, you know, for example, if you're using degeneration from the Mage's Guild skill line, which gives you major sorcery, you're not going to run spell power pots for major sorcery because you already have major sorcery. You know, uh, you're not going to run balance from the Mage's Guild skill line and run volatile armor because that would be two sources of major ward resolve. So why would you do that? You know, you want to make sure that you just get your buffs and debuffs from from like you're specifically the major and minor ones that you can really only apply. You want those from one source so that you're as, as efficient as possible and can get as many buffs as humanly possible. But like I said, the super important ones, major ward and resolve needs to be on every build. Major brutality needs to be on every stamina build. Major sorcery needs to be on every magic build. Uh, stamina, get major expedition if possible. Uh, Every build I would recommend if your Magicka have major intellect and if your stamina have major um, endurance. That comes generally from potions, so you don't have to overly worry about that. And I'd say those are pretty much the most important ones. Uh, everything else, like a lot of the minor buffs and other things, you can get from uh, certain skills. Uh, as certain play styles will, will, will tend to run certain other major buffs, but I'd say I'd say those are your big your big important ones. Magicka, if you can fit it, I'd also recommend Major Prophecy. It's a huge buff to your damage. Uh, Inner Light will provide that, and a lot of other skills and class uh, class skill lines will provide that as well. Uh, Vampire's Bane. You have Inner Light. There's a ton of options, but if you can fit that in your build, I'd recommend it. But it's obviously not mandatory. So moving on to skills and play style, I've kind of gone over 
Play style is a bit, uh, melee is going to favor a more stamina based play style. You can tell that just based off the weapons I went over and then range is going to favor a more magic play style. And again, you can just tell based off the way the weapons work. Uh, you can play more mag uh, melee magicka with, excuse me, with Templar and with magicka DK, even though you are going to be using staffs because they have skills in their class that do complement a melee style. So for the most part though, other classes will be playing more at a range. Now, you can fill in a lot of the holes that your classes are missing in their kit with skills from weapon skill lines, okay? So, more than just your class skill lines, you have your, uh, your weapon skill lines. So, noteworthy skills and passives from, let's say, the bow is obviously all the passives. Poison injection is really good for a dot and for the execute. You have draining shot, which is an amazing stun. And in hasty retreat, is just uh, such a good passive. Whenever you dodge roll, you gain major expedition. It's amazing. Uh, sword and board, all the passes are super good. Uh, reverberating bash is a stun that also gives major defile, very good. And then you also have ransack, which is a uh, major, which gives you a source of major fracture, and then also gives you, I believe it is minor resolve, I think, just minor resolve. Uh, you also have dual wield. For dual wheels, rending slash is incredibly good, or you could also run blood craze. Steel tornado, obviously spin to win. Quick cloak, because major evasion is super good, and you gain the source of major expedition. And then basically all the passives from dual wield are amazing. From 2H, I, honestly, all skills and passives from the 2H line are incredibly good. 2H is a perfect PvP weapon. Uh, for restoration staff, we have blessing of protection, mutagen slash rapid regen, healing ward, healing springs, lights champion, and then all of the passives. And then finally, from the Destro Staff, Force Pulse is a good range, spammable, or you could use uh, Destructive Clench if you have the Master Staff, Wall of Elements, Elemental Drain, as well as your Destruction Staff passives. Now, like I said, um, if you do want to play Melee, you can, uh, as Magicka, you can play Magicka Templar, Magicka DK, but do keep in mind they don't have the same movement as Stam, just something to consider. Now, survivability-wise, what you do want to consider for your build is obviously resistances, critical resist, physical resist, and spell resist. And then we have heals and shields for Magicka, and then mobility and heals for stamina. Now, I've thrown a lot of information at you guys in 32 minutes. I know it's basically been a stream of consciousness, <laughs> like I said, for 32 minutes. Uh, it's a very unscripted video because there's so much to consider, as you can tell when building i have a feeling many of you guys are going to be watching this video a couple times but i think it might be easier to kind of show some build examples and what i consider and what i think about so uh this is my resistor build okay first of all i highly recommend this website it is the uesp build editor the uesp build editor okay you can find it on their website this is how i theory craft all my builds I have so many people that tell me, Dots, just do it on the PTS. This is way quicker, okay? This is way quicker than doing it on the PTS. It is incredibly, it's it's pretty accurate. The only time I think it'll ever be a little bit of variance is in some of, like, your the resource pools. But even then, it's never, like, super off. It's maybe about, like, 100 or 2. But the UESP calculator is incredibly accurate. It's incredibly easy to work with. And... I know a lot of people say, well, test your PvP builds in the PTS. Just do, test them there. But you can't do BGs reliably very, very much. Oh, you know, I think, like, maybe, like, when a patch, like, when an expansion is about to drop, maybe people are trying to run BGs on the PTS. But for the most part, that you can't do that. There's no one in Cyrodiil. So you're limited to dueling. And in my opinion, dueling isn't necessarily indicative of how a build will do in Battlegrounds or Open World. I know specifically we're talking about Battlegrounds. But... You know, you're just better off, in my opinion, going here, putting, you know, configuring everything, looking at the stat sheet, seeing how it looks, and then boom, testing it in game. So we're going to go over a couple different builds. And the first one I'm going to cover is my Resistor Magic Dragonite build. A lot of people have been running this and they've reported all very good success with it, which makes me incredibly happy. I'm glad people are enjoying the build, but I kind of want to go through my thought process when I was creating this build. And just kind of show you guys what I think about. So the way I know that Match DK works, no secret, Match DK is the slow boy on the battlefield. It's a very, very slow class. So because it's slow, I wanted to obviously be on the tankier side. I don't want to be running a squishier Match DK build, especially not in today's PvP climate 
where damage is through the roof. I'm sure you guys, especially if you are beginners, have experienced that in BGs where you just some guy just walks up to you and absolutely creams you. Deals a lot of damage. Damage is very high nowadays. So especially as I know DK is a slower class, I'm going to need the resistances and the healing to combat all of that crazy damage that's going on. Uh, also, like I said, I just know that Mad GK is a very good class in terms of its healing, so I try to highlight and focus on that for my build. Now, where I kind of start when I make my builds varies per class. I kind of get a general thought process of what I want to do in my head, and then I kind of adjust from there. So for me, for example, I knew, okay, I want a tanky light armor build, and the reason I knew that was because, like I said, I, I know that the light armor passives are incredibly good. So if we go to armor, light, we have grace, reduces the effectiveness of snares applied to you, reduces the cost of sprint, magicka recovery, magicka cost reduction, spell resistance, spell critical, spell penetration. Light armor passives are incredibly good. So I knew, okay, I want to try to take advantage of the light armor passives, but I just want to be tanky, so I'm probably going to end up using a set like Pariah or Fortified Brass. I chose to go with Pariah to be really tanky. So that's how I kind of get my starting point. I kind of make a little pinpoint there and go, okay, this is where I want to start. So I also knew, okay, if I'm in light armor here, okay, I'm in light armor, I'm getting all this cost reduction, I'm getting all these bonuses to my sustain, I bet you if I run the Breton race... I'll get even more cost reduction, so a crazy amount of cost reduction. So, like, we have 10% uh, from Evocation, and then we get another 7% for being a Breton. Uh, right here. Get another 7% for being a Breton. That's 17% cost reduction on all of our skills. That's going to be a ton of sustain. So, I, that's again, that's kind of how I made my starting point. After that, I kind of looked at my options for... I, I will look at my options for my other gear sets. Okay, like, what, what do I want to run? I know that I'm running Pariah. Now, Pariah just literally gives, if you don't know what Pariah does, it gives a line of max health, a line of physical resist, a line of spell resist, and then increases your physical and spell resist by up to almost 11k based on your missing health. So I knew that Pariah gave me a crap ton of defensive capabilities. So most likely, I'd want to pair that with a super offensive set because I already have a super defensive set. So I went with Spinners. Spinners gives you some of the most effective weapon spell power. You, this number over here is a lot of what I, I look at this number a lot when trying to make some decisions. It's obviously not always a one-size-fits-all because it can't fit certain things like bleeds into its calculation. But it's just like a general guideline that I use. And I found that Spinners tended to be a little bit stronger than a lot of the other sets I was looking at in terms of the amount of effective spell power I gained. So I used spinners as my option. Then finally, I was thinking, okay, what should I use as my monster set? I'm, I'm really good on resistances. I have, uh, I have good damage here. You know, I have pretty good sustain with my armor choice and with my uh, race. And so I was thinking, I was like, okay, I want, I, I right now I don't have any any stamina bonuses in my builds, right? You know, even if you're a magical class, you still need stamina. I was like, I need to be able to run tri-stat food. You know, I need to get the stamina from that uh, based on the choices I've already made. I, I don't have enough stamina for it. Uh, so, I, or I don't have enough stamina. So, I want to run tri-stat food, but that means I don't get the recovery from Witch Mother's Potent Brew. Witch Mother's Potent Brew gives you magic recovery. Longfin Pasty with Melon Sauce only gives you tri-stat food. Uh, excuse me, only gives you stats. The max health, max magicka, and max stamina. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to test out a DK sustain set for my monster helmet and see if, if that gives me enough sustain to reliably run long fin pace with melon sauce. And it did. I ran blood spawn. Not only that, blood spawn gives a ton of resistances as well, which is another reason I decided to go for it. Because as you guys can tell from what I talked about earlier in the video, penetration is an incredibly important stat nowadays, right? So everyone is running a lot more penetration than they used to. So getting your resistances way over cap isn't a huge deal because you're directly countering all of the penetration that everybody's building into their setups. So even if they have a crazy amount of pen on a build like this, you're still going to be hitting me for 50% damage, you know, because of all my resistances. So I was like, you know what? 
I think that's the perfect monster set for what I want to do. Now, I'm also going to try to maximize my stats here. You know, I, I, you know, the more stats I have, the more damage I'll deal. So that's why I decided to go for a 5-1-1. I ran one heavy, one medium, and five light. Uh, in a case where maybe my build has already really good stats, but I need a little bit more tankiness, I would have ran two heavy instead of 5-1-1. But because, as you can see, the Pariah set gives me a ton of resistances, I decided to go with just a 1-1, one, 5-1-1, one, 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 to get the most amount of stats, aka the most stamina, healing, or excuse me, stamina, magicka, and health that I could physically get. That's the general overview of how I pick, you know, gear sets and, and kind of some of my thought process that goes into gear sets, goes into race, uh, goes into buff food, but another huge thing is the weapons. Like I've said, I've already gone over weapons. I went with Inferno Staff on the front part and Sword and Shield on the back part. Just, you know, complements the playstyle very well. But then the next thing to consider now is enchants as well as your traits. Now, for me, I, you know, everyone has their sweet spot for crit resist. I have found anywhere from 2.2k to 2.5k to be my minimum of what I like and enjoy nowadays. So I went to 2.5k root. So that ended up being with the amount of resistances I normally get from my CP. I'll normally place anywhere between 52 and 54 points in a resistant. I will try to go with, I went with uh, two sturdy on the body and one sturdy in the shield for my, for my blocking. And then I went with the rest on the body in pen to get me up to that, boom, 25, 13 crit resist that I like to be at. For traits on the weapons, I always recommend Nernhoned. On especially weapon bars that have some sort of healing on them. Nernhoned is an amazing, amazing trait. For Magicka, I recommend Nernhoned on the front bar. And then for Stamina, I, if you're going to run 2H, I, I do obviously recommend Nernhoned. Uh, because it's going to buff up Rally a considerable amount. But if you're using Dual Wield, I recommend Nernhoned and Sharpened. It just I feel, I feel like those end up giving you the best bang for your buck in terms of weapon. Or excuse me, in terms of damage and in terms of healing returned. But your back bar is usually very, very customizable. Um, this back bar, I don't think I'm actually running a Nernhoon back bar in game. I think I ended up running a, a defending, or not defending back bar. I ran a decisive back bar because of the amount of ult that you gain as a DK being able to, uh, let me actually fix that, being able to gain an additional ult every time blood spawn procs or every time my DK passes proc was super helpful to my sustain. So I ended up running a decisive back bar weapon. I didn't need to run defending because I already have plenty of, um, Plenty of resistances, and uh, so much of my healing is on my front bar that I didn't feel that powered was necessarily a good choice back here. So I went with Decisive for a little bit more sustain. But Nernhoned is just such a good trait for your front bar weapons. So I went with Nernhoned here. And then in terms of enchants, I think that some of the most important enchant choices is especially in your jewelry enchants. But my general rule of thumb for enchants is I'll always run Prismatics on my big pieces. You get the most bang for your buck if you run the Prismatic pieces on your large pieces because your large pieces have uh, larger enchant values than your smaller pieces. And then I always just run either max magic on my small pieces or I'll run max stamina if I am a stamina character. Now, your weapon, your jewelry enchants are, in my opinion, where a lot of your play kind of comes in here. So your, your jewelry enchants and your Mundus stone. So on, you can see on this build, I'm running the mage Mundus. I wanted to go with the mage because the effective spell power difference between the mage and the apprentice is really, really small. And I'd rather have the bigger magic pool than, than more spell damage here, more sustain. Uh, if you're stamina, generally, you're not going to want to run the tower because the way that the stamina we uh, skills work, it generally takes way more advantage of weapon damage. Um, so... But for Magicka, the difference is fairly small, so I went with the Mage here. Now, your your I have to figure out how I want to explain this. Your Mundus and your your jewelry, in my opinion, really could do coincide a lot. And the reason I say that is because this is where a lot of your sustain is going to come from. If you don't, you know, already have it from some from your food, you're going to have to make some choices here based off of what how much sustain you need. You, there's two ways you can go about this. You can either get your sustain from, or excuse me, I'm misspeaking. There's two ways you can go about this process. How you know it's a, always a question: How much recovery is enough? How much recovery is enough? That is very variable per person, and how much recovery someone needs is can be more or less than somebody else. You know, it just depends on how how proficient you are at the class. The more proficient you are, the less recovery you need. And there's two ways you can go about it. You can either over-sustain and start with way more recovery than you need, or 
you can start with way less recovery than you need and tune up, which is what I generally have been doing for my for my testing recently. I'll start with like low sustain, like like borderline low, like really low, and then I'll play it. I'll be like, okay, I ran out of magic or I ran out of stamina constantly. So I need to adjust. I need to add a stamina or magic or recovery or reduce cost glyph. Um, I need to uh, I need to change my Mundus, you know, there's, there's, you know, certain things that you can go about that. Now, the general rule of thumb that I want you guys to, to think about is that you will get more from the Mundus than you will from the Enchants. So if you need more recovery, like if you're testing and you're like, I need a lot more recovery, I'd recommend changing your Mundus first than changing an Enchant. You know, like you can change one enchant, like let's say like I run this, right? And then like, okay, my recovery is is really bad. I can start off by changing the pariah ring here to magic recovery. And then instead of, yeah, and let's say I run it and sustain still feels a little low. You know, I'm like, ah, it's still a little low. I, I need a little bit more. Instead of changing a second glyph on my jewelry to recovery losing another 174 spell damage right it's a lot of spell damage to lose okay what i would instead do as an interim step is put this back to spell damage and change my mundus to the atronach i believe the atronach gives 238 while a um while a glyph gives 169 so it's a good interim step when you're kind of testing out your enchants, you know, how you kind of want to structure those. Like, it's a good interim step between changing two enchants and, like, and just changing your mundus. So I would recommend, like, let's say you test one, and again, like you said, your recovery is too low. Put it back to spell damage or weapon damage. Go to either the Serpent or the Atronach. Test it out. And then... If it's still too low, then you adjust from there. But if it's fine, then all right, there you go. Like, for example, it's what I'm doing on my Stam DK right now. You know, I've been testing my Stam DK, and sustain feels a little bit low. And I'm currently running one reduced cost glyph. So I'm actually going to put that reduced cost glyph back to weapon damage, and I'm going to try running the Serpent and see how it feels. Um, and in terms of, I know a lot of people are going to ask about reduced cost versus magic recovery or stamina recovery. I'm going to give you a fat, it depends. Everyone has their preference, and I've seen people argue both sides of the fence. Um, I generally like to run reco Magicka Recovery on Magicka classes, and I like to run Reduce Cost a little bit more on Stam. Sometimes, though, I do like to get Recovery, again, if it's going to be from something like, um, like if I get a class like a Nightblade that gives you a passive bonus to your Recovery, you know, which, again... You read your passives before you start theory crafting all this. You need to know exactly what your class does so that you know how to kind of structure things. So, you know, for example, on a Nightblade, you get a passive that gives you 15, I think it's 15%, additional magic and stamina and health recovery, I believe. It might just be magic and stamina, but regardless. So recovery is going to, might be a little bit more valuable to you there, you know, because you have a passive class bonus to make that recovery higher. So things to consider. Uh, so that's kind of the gear thought process. I know it's a lot, but that's, that is the gear thought process. Uh, skill-wise, okay, that is gonna very much, like I said, it's gonna vary based off your class. But, what I recommend is, again, for Magicka, you want healing and shields. For Stamina, you want healing defensively. You want to make sure that you have one hard CC somewhere in, your, somewhere in your build. So a hard CC is something that someone has to CC break, Okay. Whether or not it be fossilize, uh, dizzying swing, you also have the uh, eclipse from the Templar skill line. There's so many CCs in the game. Make sure that you have at least one hard CC in your build. Trust me, you you need one. Um, past that, you also like I said, want to make sure you have a source of major brutality or sorcery. So for magic, I'd recommend if you don't get it from your class, taking a look at degeneration. And if you're stamina, you're obviously going to be uh, taking advantage of a morph of momentum. But past that, skills are really customizable. I like I said, also have a major resolve, a major ward buff. For me, I tried to go with uh, this is a dot that heals me, 
This is my big direct damage, also heals and deals big burst damage when a target's off balance. That's my hard CC. This gives me Major Prophecy, which is a massive effect of spell damage increase, and gives me a heal. This is Penetration and Sustain, so I knew that with Elemental Drain, combined with the Magic Recovery that I do have, and my Cost Reduction, that I would be perfectly fine. Now, really quick to speak on Recovery. Make sure that you understand that Recovery occurs every two seconds, okay? So, when you see something like Applies Minor Magic of Steel, causing you and your enemy to restore 300 Magic every one second, that gives you an effective 600 Magic Recovery while attacking that target. Uh, I always recommend trying to have your offensive ultimate on your front bar and a defensive ultimate on your back bar. Um, that's pretty much that's pretty much it in terms of in terms of skills. Like I said, skills are going to hugely vary based off of uh, your class and what weapons you're running. But like I said, the biggest thing is to just make sure that your buffs and debuffs are put on your skill bar as efficiently as possible. Uh, for CP, my CP guide kind of goes over it, and again, this is going to be hugely personal preference and, and class preferential. Um, as you can see, I did go like super high on like something like Shadow Ward because this, uh, back, the back bar blocks a lot. I do still have a little bit in tumbling. I went to get as much points in Arcanist as possible. I always like to go 56 in a Warlord. Uh, blue CP base varies heavily based on your build. I always go 56 in an Ironclad minimum. Uh... Resistant, I always buff this up to get, like I said, between that 2.2k and 2500 crit resist. And again, the rest of these stats are going to, the rest of this mitigation is going to super vary based off my class and my build. But that's like a general thought process to what I did when I put my Magic DK build together. Another build that I want to take a look at is my, let's look at the shade build. Let's take a look at the shade build. So, uh, I think I wanted to change this actually to, hold up, I forgot to change this in the calculator. Okay, beautiful. Beautiful. Okay, so another build that I have on my website is the Shade. So the Shade is my Heavy Armor Stam Blade PvP build. Super, super fun. Super fun. One of, this is one of my favorite builds. One of my favorite builds that I've made. So, again, we're going to kind of go with the same thought process here. I, I knew that I wanted to create a heavy armor brawling stand blade back when I played stand blade. I don't really play stand blade much anymore, but back when I played it, I knew I want to make something that's going to brawl it out. I don't want to just play that traditional stand blade style anymore. Uh, I want something that can go up in there and tussle. And I knew... Heavy armor is going to be my best option there. You know, it's going to be better than medium to get all up get all up in there, you know? And so I was trying to think about ways that I can, you know, get really tanky and get a lot of damage. Now, I knew for damage that they had a lot of options, but I ended up going with Ravager. And I know, you know, some people don't... We could, we could argue Ravager about on Stamblade until we're blue in the face. I was able to get it to proc decently well. But the point here is that you want to use a heavy... I wanted to use a heavy armor set that gave me a ton of weapon damage. Because a lot of the heavy armor sets out there, the five pieces give you a nauseating amount of weapon damage. So I went with one of those as my heavy armor set. Now, to pair with it, I knew that I wasn't going to be running Cloak. Because I wanted to run the Dark Cloak for the heal. Because I knew my health was probably going to be really, really high with how I made my build. So I was like, okay, I need to be able to take a lot of damage. Like, a lot of damage. Um, especially because, you know, my resistances aren't the world's highest. I am a Night Blade. I don't get a lot of the passive bonuses that a lot of other classes get. So I need to make, you know, myself really tanky. So I went with a set like Impreg, which gives you a lot of critical resistance also the line of magicka is super helpful for something like a night blade casts a lot of magicka skills still even as a stand blade but i knew that i wanted to get the crit resist from impreg to make myself as tanky as possible because i wanted to get all up in there <laughs> and brawl with multiple people so that's what i kind of decided to do uh for that and then i started to I, I originally think i had a different monster set here besides blood spawn i started to put my skill bars together and i noticed i couldn't fit and execute on my bar the way i made my bars the way i wanted to do things there was no way i could fit and execute into the build so i was i just i was thinking about it i was like okay well in cap only costs 70 ultimate maybe i can use in cap as 
a pseudo execute or use it to you know really really set up a huge assassin scourge proc since in cap gives you a 20 percent damage boost after it's used so i was like you know what i'll go with blood spawn for the ultimate regen and it will give me a ton of passive ultimate to get more uh more in caps off basically you know helping me execute people so blood spawn was my choice also the resistances again super super nice just really, really, really helps out with staying super tanky and being able to brawl it out. Uh, this obviously I needed to change. Oh, this very much needs to change. I have not changed that since last patch. Now, in terms of my race and stuff here, I knew I wanted to play Bosmer. I just straight up knew I was going to play a Bosmer this, for, for this build. Because the new Bosmer passes in Wrathstone are freaking amazing for Nightblade. So I knew that I wanted to go with the Bosmer. And then I also started with the Warrior Mundus. Like I said, I always try to start with the more damaging option and then tune my um, recoveries as needed. I knew that Bosmer gives a crap ton of recovery. So I knew I wanted to start with the Warrior. So like normally on other, like, like this build, right? The Resistor, I started with the Mage. And if I needed that extra recovery, maybe I would have, you know, tossed in the Atronaut gear and then changed the gear set. But like I stated earlier, I tend to start with less recovery and move up. So I started with the Warrior. And so we have our gear sets picked out. She explained how I got those picked out. Uh, so I knew for Enchants again, Triple Prismatic, I always do that. Or excuse me, there here I ran a Stam Glyph. And the reason I ran a stamp glyph here is because look at my freaking health. I have almost 30k maximum health, okay? And I have 12.5k maximum magicka, which is plenty for this type of build, okay? Which is plenty. So I knew I don't need triple prismatic here. So I just ran two prismatic, got my stats to where, I, you know, especially my magicka to where it felt comfortable. And then I just went with another stamp glyph here. And then I did stamina glyphs on my other pieces. Now I also knew because I'm running impreg. I don't need to run a ton of well, uh, a ton of impen. So I just have two impen blood spawn just to get me to 3,500 crit resist. Really, really, really tanky with that. Um, and I run the rest well fitted to give me that extra stam, uh, you know, cost reduction on my roll dodge and sprint that I don't get because I'm in heavy armor. I also did decide to go with a 511, I believe, for this build to give me huge max stats. Okay. I wanted to go with that because, as you can see, by going 5-1-1, look at my freaking health. It's insanely high. Uh, and it also makes my magic and stamina pools very respectable as well. Now, for my jewelry, I ended up going with two weapon damage and one stamina recovery. During my testing, I started off with three weapon damage, did some BGs and some uh, Cyrodiil. Recovery felt a little low, so I popped the stamina recovery glyph on here, and things felt okay. So I stayed with that. Weapon choice, again, I went with, I chose to go with dual wield and 2H. I'm in love and dual wield and 2H. I've been loving it. So I ran dual wield and 2H for my weapon choices. And again, like I said, Nern honed and sharpened. Most bang for your buck here. And then in terms of the actual dual wield weapons themselves, you know, what do I want to use a mace? Do I want to use an axe? Do I want to use a, a sword, a dagger? You know, it, it's hugely personal preference. Everyone has what they like and what they enjoy. I always prefer axe as my main hand weapon and then i'll either run a mace or a sword as my offhand weapon depending on if i want more pen or more tooltip damage so that just kind of depends on what i'm doing and then back bar this is like a defensive bar anyway so i just ran an axe for a chance to proc the 2h bleed i don't ever expect it to really proc but i went with it just in case um and i th think that pretty much covers it uh skills like i said i i kind of exp you know explain skills are hugely personal preference um i knew that for my nightblade right nightblades need a certain level of magicka recovery because of how much magicka skills they do cast even as a stand blade so i decided okay i can either try to get my magicka recovery for my gear or i could try to get it for my skills so i actually decided to run siphoning attacks which took care of all of my magicka sustain for the build also because i am a heavy armor build i made sure to run it forward momentum which gives me some source of snare, immobilization, immunity, etc. Which is, a, I, ha I recommend that type of thing for every build. You know, my resistor build, reflect a plate, gain immunity to snares and immobilizations. For momentum, gain immu uh, immunity to snares and immobilizations. If you're running a Templar, 
if you're not, if you're running a heavy armor Templar, right, you're going to want to run either forward momentum or you're going to want to run quick cloak plus uh, cleanse so that you can cleanse those snares off you and then quick cloak away. But you always want a way to, to relieve yourself of snares. And if you don't have that, you might want to consider picking up vampirism and running um, mist form. And then if you do choose to do that, though, you're going to want to be super tanky because of the fact that you chose to run vampirism. So like, for example, I ran vampirism on my resistor build, one for the little bits of recoveries I'd get, but mainly because the, if I can find it, the undeath passive paired super wolf pariah reduces your damage taken by up to 33% based on your missing health. Pariah gives me more resistance as my health gets lower. They paired very, very well. So for me, I didn't mind running vampirism, but because vampirism does make you squishier, you want to wear it when you're like on a tanky build. So at least that's my opinion. Um, so, you know, if you need, like, if you have a magic unit that needs to get its snare, snare removal from mist form, I would recommend being tanky. But anyway, um, that's kind of how I, I chose to run siphoning attacks, and like I said, why I run, chose to run forward momentum. And then I chose to structure my bars very basically. Heals and defense on the back bar, offense and CC on the front bar. Doesn't get much simpler than that. Uh, and then like I said, I did choose to run the dubious food, um, I knew that I'd be able to get the maximum magic I wanted. Uh, I, you know, I, I kind of started with Dubious, and then when I was playing around with gear sets, I ended up getting a pretty respectable Magicka pool from wearing 511 and Impreg. Maybe if my Magicka pool was still really low, maybe here I would have tried Tri-Stat food and maybe would have had to readjust my gear. But as you can see, it's a little bit of a dance between your stats. Like, where do I want to get my stats from? Can I get them from the gear? Do I want to get them from enchants? Do I want to get them from my race? Do I want to get them from my food? You know, there's a lot of a lot of factors at play here. A lot of factors at play. Uh, I think that pretty much that pretty much covers it. Because like I said, offensive ability in the front bar and defensive on the back bar. So I know this video got super long. I know this video got super long. And I know it was just kind of like a flow of thoughts. But I hope you guys really, really enjoyed it. This was an uh, enjoyable video to make and kind of talk about my thought process. And you guys can now see why. Even when I'm trying to go to sleep at night, my, my mind thinks about builds because there's so much, there's so much that goes into a build. There's so many factors. And guys, I know this was more of a, I know this is a more complex video for a beginner guide series. I understand that. Um, I would definitely recommend, okay, if this video went way over your head, you need to check out the how to choose your armor, racial passives guide, how to choose your weapon. Munda Stone, what CP are best and why, and Champion Point Jump Points. If you really want to start theory crafting and thinking about how to create your own builds, you need to understand the mechanics of the game, at very least at a base level first, to give you a rough idea of where you need to be going. Also, I hope that these that this video, through me explaining all this, kind of helps clarify why certain builds run the way they run like for example i chose to run dual wield because i wanted to run rending slashes because for the bleed and for the snare you know maybe if i didn't want to run a dot you know a build with a dot like that i could have ran a 2h on the front bar and have gone for a more bursty play style you know it i hope that this video kind of explained the thought processes for, behind um certain builds and why you might want to use certain things you know again like you know maybe you want to use a bow if you want a form of major expedition from hasty retreat, you know, instead of maybe trying to get it from a potion, you know, it's, it's just a lot of trying to decide where you want to get certain bonuses from and then kind of going down that path and seeing what you can do. So I hope this kind of, and me explaining this thought process and, and everything that goes into a build kind of showed you as well, why certain people do the things that they do when they make guides. Um, and do understand that the build creation process is a it's a it's a process that you learn over time. It's never something that it's not something that you will I think that you will master quickly. It's a lot of trial and error, lots of testing, lots of learning. I still learn stuff to this day. There are certain builds that I make that just they just straight up don't work, or I forget that the sets that there's better that are better, or I maybe make some stuff that's a little bit unoptimized, but it's a forever it's a process that will be forever ongoing and even if you decide dots i don't want to make builds of my own i hope that this video still clarified some of the thought processes and some of the uh why people do certain things 
for their build so that now if maybe you take someone else's build guide or one of my build guides and you build it and you want to change it, you can make educated decisions on how to change it and alter it for yourself. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Please let me know what you thought in the comment sections below. And if you did find it helpful, I'd appreciate it if you smacked a like on it. And to keep up with the rest of the Battleground Guide series, as well as the rest of the Elder Scrolls content on my channel, please hit the sub button as well as the bell to keep notifications on. And if you want to ask me questions live, please be sure to stop by twitch.tv slash dots gaming. Drop a follow and you're more than welcome to ask me for build questions, help, or advice while I am live. So I want to thank you guys so much for watching today. I very much appreciate it. As always, I'm Dots Gaming, and I'll see you all in the next video.